Good evening. Welcome back to our Triple D broadcast. We are live from Living Hope Presbyterian Church as we work our way through the Westminster Confession of Faith, and today we're on a new chapter. Yes. You sound like a newscaster, man. <laughs> I swear. Based on the pay I get, maybe Sounds that's... like an NPR talk show radio or whatever we're going with there. A compliment or is that a put down? I don't know. We'll, we'll put that as both. How about okay. that? That's a thinly right. veiled compliment. Oh, How about okay. that? All yeah. Right. So, yes, thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, we are starting a new section, new chapter. We're at chapter 16, so previously for the last few months we've been going over repentance. So now we're moving onwards from repentance. So in order to do these things which we're going to talk about, one has to have faith and be repentant. You have to be justified. You have to be being sanctified in order to do these things. So we're talking about good works. Good work. So in good works can only be done by the Christian because if they're not done to the glory of God, if anything that is not done in faith is sin. Therefore, we have to have faith in order to do good works. And the world would strongly disagree with that. The world's going to strongly disagree with that and kick it every turn. So let's go ahead and jump into our chapter okay. then, into our section. So we're just going to be looking at one section a day. It's pretty short. It's kind of the summary and the catch-all of the chapter. Uh, so we'll discuss this for a little bit today. Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, and not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intention. So we get exactly what a definition of good works are. Now, I was discussing this with some of my classmates the other day too, actually, and we see a list of what exactly determines what a good work is and what a good work is not. So when you go and perform an action and you think, is this good? Is this glorifying to God? Then you can look at Westminster, actually, and go through this little rubric. Uh, it's a very helpful little rubric when you're going into an action, and the divines are trying to tell you what exactly is a good work. So, Steve, first and foremost, I want to ask you the question. So, what is the first requirement for a good work to be considered good in God's sight? Well, it must be something that's commanded in the Bible mm -hmm. or coming from God's Word. Mm -hmm. It might not be stated in a, in a, in a clear command, but it sure. must be something that's stated in God's Word. And because the, the standard of what's good is not you and not me and mm -hmm. it's not the world, it's God. Mm. So God's going to determine what's good. Absolutely. I think that that's a huge, huge important thing, what you just said, that the standard of good is what God has said. The standard of good is God's Word. We can't simply look around us and then deduce what is good and what is right from the world around us. Uh, we can understand something about that, absolutely, but we can't understand it fully. Uh, so we're going to get more into that too. But remember, the standard of how to understand what a good work is in God's sight and what a good work is not, we go to the Bible. We go to God's Word and we see that that is required, that which is commanded of us, or that which we deduce from the Bible is right in God's sight. It can only be done by the Christian. We'll get more into that in just a moment uh, because those are all qualifiers of what a good work is. So yeah, first and foremost... What is a good work? Look what the Bible says about it. Uh, when the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, it is good to not kill somebody. It's also good not to hate somebody unjustly in your heart. Uh, it is good to not covet your neighbor's oxen, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's so on and so forth in the Tenth Commandment. Those are all things that are good, and they are either explicitly set down or deduced from the Scripture. Well, this gets really touchy because we all, as, as trained uh, Christians who know mm. our Bibles, we all would say, agree that the Pharisees tried to do things by works. Mm. But, w but we, many times, we who are saved, in a more subtle way, try to do the same thing. Absolutely. We think, Absolutely. well, I'm going to do this good thing, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to earn God's favor by uh, putting money in the plate or going to church or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. We all can fall into that trap. Absolutely. Uh, that's actually one of the proof texts. We're not going to uh, go to that one today. Uh, we're not going to use that one, but there are several proof texts that the divines use that talk about Pharisaical religion. Uh, which is you're trying to justify yourself in the sight of God by doing good works or by doing that which the Bible commands. You're not saved because of your good works. You're saved unto good works. Uh, that's the point of the book of James as well. Uh, so, Steve, I'm going to also ask you this. So, it, since it's commanded by God's holy word, what is a good work and what is not, are there good works that the world considers good but God's word condemns? Oh, ab absolutely, because the Bible says anything that we do must be done for God's glory. Mm -hmm. So you take our, our liberal friends and liberal churches, 
they're doing a much better job many times of reaching out in the culture and, and feeding the poor and, and building the hospitals and mm -hmm. things like that than we conservatives are. So they can put us to shame on that. But let's go back to the, to the why. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I go out and build a hospital and I'm not a believer and I say, okay, I've done this good thing. It is good, it is good in the eyes of the world and it's mm -hmm. a good thing in that we're helping the sick people and that thing. But it wasn't done to the glory of God. So in God's eyes, it wasn't a good work. Yes. Absolutely. Now, there are many, ev many evangelicals are even going to struggle with that. Absolutely. So, yeah, you have such good people in history, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, for instance. Mm, yeah, good uh, so there's a good example right there. Definitely not a believer, explicitly a non-believer, because he even said he didn't like the church or didn't like Christians. Uh, he said he liked Jesus, but he liked a Jesus of his own making. Uh, but Mahatma Gandhi did some good stuff, though. Did some good stuff. Uh, but... Were they good in God's eyes? Absolutely not, because what is not done in faith is of sin. So, and yeah, you're right. A lot of us evangelicals, we have a struggle with that because we see people who we know are not believers doing good. So there's a distinction between what is good for the common, the common good of humanity, as it were. There can be good things done in the world's eyes, but they're not good in God's sight, though. You know, one thing that's sad about that, you may have an unbeliever who's, who's doing more, quote, good mm. for the culture than a Christian who Absolutely. is is just he's reading his Bible, he's going to church, but he's not getting engaged in the community, he's not helping the hurting and, and that's one of the great privileges and jobs of being a deacon. Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's why one of the reasons we're going to get to church officers eventually, Lord willing, as well. That's one of the beautiful things about the diaconate. Uh, you have, I mean, this is an office that's ordained by God to oh, do these things. Point, yeah. uh, and it's not just something that the church decided, well, I guess we got to have somebody who's doing this thing. So, I mean, everybody is called to do good works, absolutely, but the deacon specifically is called to these acts of mercy ministry. Uh, John Giordo, an old Southern Presbyterian theologian, wrote very well on what the deacon does. The elder is a divinely ordained gospel office. It is just the same with the deacon, but it has a different scope. It's a temporal versus a spiritual office. That means that you're trying to serve people within the world rather than just serving God, but you're serving God through serving people. And you made a good point to me. We're getting off subject here. Oh, that's but okay. You made a good point to me that in the Bible there's only one difference between the elder and the deacon. Mm -hmm. Yep, ability to teach. It's the only difference. Other than that, you're called to the same task too. So, Steve, I'm going to get back into our gears here. So why would men, therefore, if there is a standard of good, a standard of righteousness, why is it that men would devise other standards other than God's word? Well, I think that's because of the, of the fall, mm -hmm. sin, uh, original sin that's in us, and as but yet we still have this image of God in us, so we want to try to do some good things. Mm -hmm. And also, in in some ways, as unbelievers, we think that we 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 will, will deny God, as Van Til would say. But at the same time, we want to do things to try and uh, getting good with God. Mm -hmm. So you we're going to do, but it but boils down to one word would be sin. Be absolutely. Sin. Absolutely. So yeah, you're going to devise, uh, the fallen man is going to devise things that he thinks would be pleasing, uh, because every man in his heart of hearts does believe in something above himself. Uh, there's nobody who's born an atheist. I think that that's proved, just look at the world around you. Uh, there's never been a culture that's come out saying, well, we don't believe in anything. Uh, there never has been. You've had to arrive at that through a lot of depravity. Uh, so often, man has this innate sense about himself, too, that he has to prove himself. He has to do something in order to merit something out there. He has to do good. Even the atheist usually doesn't go all the way as far as his sinful soul will allow him to. He doesn't go and become a mass murderer overnight just because he doesn't believe there's no God. There's still something that's restraining him there. Still saying something that, I know I need to do this. Uh, so man, in his depravity, yes, he devises other standards, but he still is seeking to do something that which is good. It's not good in God's sight, absolutely. But he understands, even in his rebellion, that he has to do something. Uh, and I think that that's why every other religion, other than Christianity, is a works-based religion. I have to do something good in order to merit uh, good sight in God's eyes or in the, the great spirit's eyes, whatever you have you. So yeah, absolutely, Steve. I think that, that you see that everywhere, that men are devising other standards other than what the Bible says. So I'm going to ask you one thing, too, and this is a bit controversial, but are those man-made works wrong, even if done with good intention? If I'm a non-believer and I go and build a hospital, is that wrong? Well, 
if you, in the eyes of the world and culture and helping people, no. But according to the Bible, in God's eyes, yes, it's wrong. Because you did, your motives were wrong when you built the hospital. Mm. You did not build that hospital to the glory of God and to, and to, and to show the loss of the love of God and things mm. like that. So, yeah, I would say, yes, it's wrong, even if it's done with good intention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if you're desiring to help somebody as a non-believer, you're not doing it first and foremost to the glory of God. So, absolutely, Steve, I would say that that's a... Your your light just turned on red. I'm sorry. Oh, did so really? I'm going to uh, share oh, the microphone okay. with you for a second here. Should I turn this off? You're good. Yeah, go ahead and turn it off. Go ahead and turn it off. Well, sorry about that. We're a low budget operation, right. ain't we? Yep. So well, that means we'll yeah. have a new battery for Sunday morning. Exactly. I know so that. Sunday morning we'll be okay. We're well, kind of close here, brother. That's the that's the <laughs> more important day. So you know, the Lord's day is going to be more important than our podcast for sure. But okay. yes. So those even done with good intention are wrong in the sight of God. Now there is a difference, as I said earlier, between common good and then good according to God's standard. We understand that it's a good thing, certainly, for somebody to go and volunteer at the local soup kitchen. That's a good thing in the eyes of the world and even in the eyes of most Christians. Uh, We're not discounting that, but it's not good in the eyes of God. It's not going to do you any good in the day of judgment. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, Lord, Lord, in your name do we not prophesy in your name. In your name cast out many demons, and in your name do many great and wonderful miracles. And Christ says to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I do not know you, or I never knew you, is what the word says there. Uh, So yes, those works are not necessarily good. We have to understand them through the lens of God, and according to God's standard, God's scripture. See, let's go ahead and jump into our proof text then. If you would turn over to Micah chapter 6, verse 8, please. This this is a great one. This is good. You preached on this not too long ago. I did. I did use this for Christmas and the Christmas message, and I said, what does Jesus want for Christmas from you? What are we commanded to do? Uh, Here we go. Verse 8. He has told you, old man, what is good. Okay, there we've been talking about good. He's told us what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Mm. You have that one highlighted in your Bible as well. That's I do. A, it's a good yeah. one to highlight, a good one to remember. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of folks are in our broader culture today of social justice. We're all looking what to do as far as that which is just, that which is good. Well, that which is just and that which is good is commanded by God. That's what Westminster is saying. If you want to know what's good, what's just, what's right, what's equitous, you go to the standard. You go to the scriptures. Mm. You go to what God has said because God is the standard of I'm going to turn over to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And in in Romans 12, verse 2, it's a pretty familiar verse to most of our listeners who are believers. We're studying that one not too long ago myself either. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Want to know what good is? Want to know what perfect is? You have to be renewed in your mind by the Holy Spirit. You have to be regenerated. You have to present your body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord because you are bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You belong to God, both heart, soul, mind, strength, body, soul, spirit. All of your being now belongs to God. You know what good is now because you've gone to the standard, because you've been regenerated in your mind. Non non-believer can't understand the things of Scripture, can't understand what's good because he doesn't know God who is good. Christ makes that clear as well to the rich young ruler. Why do you call me good? There is only one that's good, and that's God the Father. So, Steve, why don't you turn over to the next one? It's an example. 1 Samuel 15, 21 through 23. Okay, I hope you can hear me well. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Mm. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, better than building a hospital, Mm. whatever it may be, better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is the sign of divination witchcraft, and insubordination is is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. That's to Saul right there as well. So, yes, the Lord desires obedience and not sacrifice. He says that over and over again in the Old Testament as well, that, yes, they were important for that time because they showed Christ who was to come. They were a type of him who was to come. But the Lord desires obedience. That's what he's getting at in all of these texts as well. The Lord does not desire ritual, ceremony. He doesn't need that $20 you put in the offering plate. He wants you to do it because you're obeying him. 
He doesn't want you to do it just because you think that this is good or because you're trying to earn favor with him. Uh, that's what Saul was trying to do. Saul thought he was doing a good thing. Well, I'm bringing, I've been commanded to bring sacrifices before the Lord. I'm trying to do that. But that's not what God had commanded. Co- obey the Lord's commands. This is what is pleasing in his sight. And don't think that because you go to church on Sunday morning and, and read the Lord's Prayer that you're good to go for the week. Absolutely not. Absolutely. That's a great application there. Yeah, God doesn't need worshipers. Uh, Solomon realized that in the dedication to the temple in 1 Kings 8. You know, Lord, you cannot be contained by the highest of heavens. How much littler with this house that I have built for you contain your glory? There's no way. Absolutely. The same as our works, filthy rags in his sight. So I'm going to turn over to Romans chapter 10, verse 2. And in Romans 10, 2, this is talking about, we talked about Pharisaical religion a minute ago. So, and we read here, For I testify about them, that's talking about the Jewish people before Christ came, that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They didn't know God truly. They were trying to placate him by making all these little rules, tithing a tenth of even your spice cabinet, going in there with a teaspoon and saying, this is a tenth of my spices, I'm putting this aside for the Lord. The Lord doesn't desire those things. He desires obedience from a right and pure heart. That's what Christ is getting at in the Sermon on the Mount as well. You think that you're good just because you haven't murdered anybody, but Christ says, well, it's to murder even if you have unjust anger in your heart. So cleanse the heart first and foremost before going into the action. And I think that's that's going to wrap us up for the day as well, Steve. So I'm going to ask you to turn over to Psalm 1 and end us today. Let's talk about what, what a good and righteous man looks in the eyes of God. I'm going to be using this verse uh, uh, in Sunday morning, this Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not do something. What does he not do? He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves does not wither, and whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." Mm. Absolutely. Talking about what a good and righteous man does in the eyes of the Lord. He's trusting in the Lord his God. He's planted beside those streams of still water. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to switch back to you, though, because I have to go click the button. So why don't you uh, greet our viewers and thank them for being here. All right. Well, thank you very much, and meet with the hope we see you next week as we continue in the Westminster Confessions talking about good works. See you then.